Agajanian Quinn, a member of the California Arts Council and Beverly Hills Arts Commission, is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories can be read in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to California Apparel News. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to Joan Quinn, etc. Our guest today is actress Anne DeSalvo. Anne has originated several roles on Broadway. She received an Obie for distinguished performance in Albert Inarado's Gemini. She's appeared off Broadway. She's been in many, many TV shows. She's been in film for cable, but she's best known for the movies she's made. And what medium do you like the best? Is one easier than the other? Well, I have to say that I love the theater the most still after all this time. Um, it's the chance uh, that the actor gets to have the most control over his work. It's very physical. You have a beginning, a middle, and an end every evening. And um, it's a high that's um, it's a rush when you're on the stage. But the movies give you the fame and the money <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, immortality, if, you, if there is such a thing. You're living in Los Angeles now. Is the yeah. stage the same to you as it was in New York? Do you still get that rush when oh, you're Oh, yeah. I just did a play this year, uh, Lend Me a Tenor, at the Pasadena Playhouse. And I hadn't been on stage in four years. And uh, it just brought back you know, the reasons why I, went, I, I became an actress. I mean, just that, that rush and the excitement of being in front of a live audience when anything could go wrong and, and uh, the camaraderie of the cast and it was a great... Is that what happens? Is that what happens, the difference between being in a movie or being on the stage? You have a tight-knit little group with the actors on stage? Well, you can have that on a series or a movie too, depending. But there's something about really pulling it uh, across every night uh, when you, when the director leaves, see a play, uh, mm -hmm. you rehearse right. and then the director leaves and the playwright leaves and you're there with the group. When you do a series or a movie, the writer can be around, the director's always around. So there's a sense of really running the ship yourself when you do a play. I see. We talked in the beginning when, when I introduced you about originating roles. Is, is tell me the differential in that as, as far as being the person who's originated a role. Well, uh, when you uh, originate a role on stage, you are the person that really puts your signature on it. And very often, like in rehearsal, sometimes you'll improvise things or you work so closely with the writer and you'll say, you know, this scene doesn't feel right. Do you think we could sort of flesh it out in this way? So you're sort of more involved with, with the actual making and the creating of the role, as opposed to my playing a role that Tennessee Williams wrote 50 years ago that has been interpreted by so many actresses along the line. Mm -hmm. And the first one was probably the one that had the most um, uh, advantage and most signature on, on the role. The most input, probably. Yes, exactly. Uh, is that a dream of an actress to be the original or the originating actress in a drama or a play or whatever? Well, yeah, sort of. I mean, it it, um, it allows you the most freedom. It allows the most of your personality or um, what your instinct about the character is to uh, affect its writing. And once it's written and it's published, that's it. Uh, but then when you go on and you see other people play that that role, does it then depend on the director as far as getting out of you, um, how you go back to the original interpretation or? Well, the director has his vision and you probably, in, in taking it on, have a certain idea of what you want. And the idea in, in every uh, creative uh, work is to have a collaboration, is to use the director's input and your input and maybe, uh, you know, if the writer is there and, and work together. That's the best, is when you can all use your facility and, and, and make it the best you can make it. Do you have a favorite director? You've worked with a lot of them, I know. Um, I think Woody Allen's my favorite. I know you worked with Paul Morrissey, who's yes. one of my favorite oh, yeah, people. Yeah, he was great. He was great, too. He was real quirky and 
completely wide open, completely wide open, and Woody was like that too. I mean, before I worked with him, people said to me, oh, he's going to give you line readings, and he's, he's so persnickety that what he wants a certain thing a certain way. And I found him to be not like that at all. He uh, was completely trusting of what I was doing. He just, and I improvised a lot in, in the film. I did Stardust Memories. And he would just say to me, just make sure you say these lines and uh, you can improvise all you want around it. So. And then the film with Paul Morrissey was Spike. Spike from Bensonhurst, yeah. Did you have that same freedom? Yeah, Paul was uh, completely open and I told him that I wanted to make this character the Jackie Onassis of Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I love playing characters that are completely out of touch with themselves. I think they're the most fun to play, especially in comedy, <laughs> where um, there's so much irony as to who people think they are and who they really are or what they want to project to the world, and uh, that was a character that I really enjoyed doing. You, you've you worked with Peter O'Toole, and you mentioned Woody Allen, as an actor, I guess, Woody Allen, and uh, Charles Grodin, and we have a clip from the movie you did with Charles Grodin, uh -huh. so will you tell us a little bit about it? Um, yeah, this was a film called Taking Care of Business, and this is one of my favorite films because it was a chance for me to be vulnerable. I always play such tough cookies, and <laughs> I play villains, and I play bad girls, and this was a chance uh, to play someone who was really wounded, who was in love with Charles Grodin, and he was married, and I was convinced that he should be divorced, and that we were the love of each other's lives, and I very seldom get to play characters that are pierced, you know, I'm always piercing other people, so it's a special, special role for me. So we'll say it okay. right now. Barnes? Toby Lipton! Ashcroft, hi! Oh. How are you? Oh, God. Oh, my God. It's good to see you. You look good. You used to cheat off me in history. That's right. That's right. You got me into Chicago Community College. You did. Thank you. Uh -huh. So, how, how are, are you two together? Uh -huh. No? Because my seat's right over there. Why don't we switch so Spencer and I can reminisce? Oh, I, I see. Oh, great. Oh, okay. okay. I've got a lot of work. Oh, to it's do. okay. I'll help you. Come on, this is an event. No problem. I'm happy do you to. Mind? I don't mind. No, I don't I mind. I don't mind, yeah. You, you never know when you're going to bump into people, huh? No. Yeah, it's really amazing. God. Right. Oh, God, great. Yeah. I love the window. So, how are you? Oh, I'm. You know I'm in makeup? Uh -huh. Yeah, I was in Chicago for a moisturizer convention. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so what have you been up to for the last 25 years? Oh. What? I, 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 I. <laughs> that was great. Chicago Community College? What yeah. does that mean? Oh, that they, um, they originally had written Vassar. <laughs> and I said, there's nothing funny about Vassar. It's to say that, you know, I cheated off of you and I got into community, uh, Chicago <laughs> Community College, I thought was uh, funnier, so they let me go with it. So you just kind of ad-libbed it? Yeah, the writer was on the set a lot, and it was okay. Have you done a lot of film for uh, the cable networks? Um, I did a film last year with Brian Brown for USA Cable. Mm -hmm. Can I say that on, is it okay? Sure. At USA Cable, and uh, I had a ball. I think uh, cable is uh, really opening up a lot of opportunities. I think that network, after a while, gets a little um, hemmed in and uh, it's a little tighter. I think there's a, a little bit more space to be creative, and I think cable's really going to take off more and more. What about the viewership, though? People who would see a film on cable obviously have to be hooked up to the cable, whereas in a theater, they can just take their family and go to the theater and pick and choose what they want to do. They don't have to be hooked up. Do you think that would keep people from being the audience that you're looking for? or um, helps? Well, I think that things are getting very expensive for a lot of people right now with the recession and uh, people are less willing to go out and by the time they park and, and pay for the movie and get popcorn and soda and then maybe go out for a little bite afterwards. They're talking about a couple can spend $60. It was like with the, the stage in, in New York is ridiculous now. And I think that if people, I know that my film, uh, the Brian Brown film, is uh, uh, in VCR, uh, is uh, um, in the stores now. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, people can rent things. So they can do, so I think yeah. it probably does. What projects are you looking for in the future? Would you direct or produce or write? Well, I optioned a book a couple of years ago, and... Uh, 
I am I'm presently working with someone who is um, very, very talented. I can't say her name right now. Do you, do you write? Would you write with her? Is that what you're uh, doing? No, she wants to produce and direct it. And uh, we're looking for a writer. I think we found a writer this week, actually. So it's very exciting who would adapt the book. But yeah, I'm very interested in getting my hands in, into a couple of other pots in the business. Would you also act in it? Yeah, yes, so it's you, definitely, so okay. it's a role for me, definitely a role for me. But I think it's the way to go, and I think that women are always complaining about how there's so few good parts, and unless we start really getting more aggressive and empowering ourselves and just sort of assuming that we can be out there doing, uh, then we're going to be victims always. So we just have to get out there and just take a little bit. And you have to have the experience, and you have to know how to do it, which yeah. I think you do. Well, know you know how something, do. Joan. I, <coughs> I, when I do a film now, I really hang around the camera a lot mm. because I hear and I listen and I see how they set up shots and what lens they're using and how they they motion, uh, how they're shooting, actually shooting the shot. Because I want to pick up as much as I can. So uh, uh, when I have that opportunity, I can really take it. You said uh, that you went to art school. Yeah. So you probably have an eye for that as well, a trained eye. So you can pick up what the camera's doing and the way a set scene would look. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, uh, I did go to art school and I was uh, studied painting and design and um, so you learn to, in, in something like a rectangular shape, you learn to know, you know what you can put in and whether, like Woody Allen, if you watch him very often, he sometimes will have the camera on a, com on a completely empty room where the conversation is going on somewhere else. Mm. I mean, it's about style, it's about uh, projection, and... And, um, and yeah. very creative. Yeah. I think artists can really put a different kind of creative eye into something like that. Well, it's all visual. It I mean, is. it's, 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 it's uh, multi-dimensional, but I mean, it's firstly visual. One of the, you mentioned being in Lend Me a Tenor, and I saw it, and I thought you were really wonderful. You Thank had you. so much attitude. Um, do you speak any other language? I speak Italian. I mean, I'm a, I have an Italian background, but uh, it was never spoken in the home, but I studied it in college, mm. and, um, and I went to Italy for a while, and I study French on Saturdays. I've been studying French every Saturday for the last year and a half. Oh, good. So, um, Do you uh, take singing lessons? You didn't sing in this play. No, but I sang in New York. I used to sing on the stage, but I haven't sung in so long. Uh, Do you dance? I was a dancer. <laughs> I feel like, you know, yes, I've done, uh, you know, whatever you say, I've done. Um, I, did, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I was in art school, and I fell in love with a dancer in Philadelphia, and, um, and I got involved in his dance company, and I thought that's what I wanted to do, oh. and, and then I somehow became an actress. And before we leave, I want to ask you, did you ever play in all the roles a blue-eyed, blonde-haired cheerleader or... No, no, that's my <laughs> nemesis. No, I've never done that. But strangely enough, something like um, Arthur. Uh -huh. you know, I played the prostitute in Arthur, and uh, originally they wanted a blonde, blue-eyed actress. And, you know, if you go in sometimes and you're special enough, uh, I mean, I don't mean to be stroking <laughs> myself too much here, but I mean, if you've got something to offer that's a little bit maybe more original and people are open to listen to it, it can really be... Uh, turned out to be wonderful. You didn't put on a wig. Hell no! <laughs> Hell no! This is it. This, this is, is it. it. This right. is what you get. That's right. And this is what we got today. And De Salvo, a very, very warm person. Thank thanks, you. Anne. Thank you, Joan. And thanks for being with us. Come back after the break. And DeSalvo left, and we redressed the set, and I redressed, and we got ready for artist Larry Bell, who's our guest in the second part of the show. Larry was born in Chicago in 1939. His family moved to California, where he graduated from high school. At that point, Larry had to make a choice. He had three things to do, or to decide on. Either to go to trade school, to join the armed forces, or to get a job. He went to Chouinard Art School, which was the closest at that time to a trade school. I think he made the right decision. His work has been exhibited in 
uh, museums across the country. His work is also uh, in the permanent collections of museums across the country and in Europe. He's in the collection of Beaubourg in France and the Tate in London, the Modern Museum of Art at, in New York, and in the Whitney. He's, he had a studio in Venice for many years and he gave it up in the 70s to go to Taos, New Mexico. Larry is represented by Kiyo Higashi in Los Angeles and he once said, it may be a privilege to be an artist, but I also have the right to make a living. Let's go through the decades with Larry and see how he made his living. Hi, Larry. Hi, Joan. <laughs> in the 60s, you were working on shaped canvases. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, the, I was involved with the idea of creating a volume on a flat plane. And uh, I, I had worked in a picture framing shop out in Burbank in a, in a space between a school in a slot, time slot, between one semester and another semester at school, and, and um, I started experimenting with small boxes, small cons pieces, like shadow boxes, making little objects out of them, and that got me to thinking about v volumes, uh, and I started painting illusions of volumes and the illusions eventually became objects again and all of a sudden I went from being a painter to a sculptor and so is that so on. would this be something yeah. of, of what that we're talking was, about that was one of the shaped canvases and uh, the shape actually takes place because it's what well the sides it was a, a rectangular canvas plane and i had simply lopped the corners off of it to give the illusion of it being sort of like a brick mm -hmm. and then the imagery in the interior of the canvas was painted to replicate that volume at that time were you working with vapor coated no Pro nothing no. At, at that time then into the 70s uh, you got into constructing glass. Well, in the mid-60s, I, uh, I took these canvases to the next step, which was to eliminate the canvas and create a volume made out of glass. So the, uh, at, there was a period in there where I had taken uh, the uh, canvases and inserted a piece of glass into the center of it and, uh, mm. to give us some other sp dimensional quality. And then I eliminated the canvas and went to making these cubic kind of volumes out of glass. So is this with yeah, this Yeah, that's one example? of the very first pieces, yes. So they started out s small in scale. This is right. 13 inches. That's correct, yeah. And they, they Were you painting these or were they mirrored? They're surfaces? actually, they're mirrored. The, they're, the glass was mirrors with, that I scraped away the the, ref the reflective coating on the back so that you could see through the glass. And, and the, the vapor technique was simply a, a, a surface treatment for plating glass or other things that um, was reflective on both sides. In other words, I could deposit this vapor onto a piece of glass and it would be a mirror on both sides. Tell right? us a little bit what the vapor was. I think the first time I met you, you had a large uh, machine. I don't know. It was like a big no, funnel, a big, tunnel. A big, <laughs> a big vacuum chamber. Is what it was essentially a big bottle that I could remove the air from. And uh, when you uh, took the air out, it became sort of like a light bulb in the sense that there was a tungsten filament inside and the material that I wanted to evaporate, I'd put on that filament, place what I wanted to be coated in some proximity to the filament, remove the air from inside the bottle, and then bring up the heat on the filament like a light bulb on a dimmer. When the tungsten got hot enough, the material would evaporate. And so that's what it's called, no. a vapor called, coating? The actual technique is called vacuum deposition of thin films. It's a and if you heat stuff up until it gets hot enough to reach a vapor pressure and it evaporates and coats whatever's in front of it. Were you a scientist? No. How did you learn how to it's do it? It's a common industrial plating technique. And um, I just got a book called 
thin film plating, you know. And, As yeah. you started working with this vapor, you started making pieces of glass that were are standing yes. figures then. You, so well, you were plating the glass or coating the yes, glass? Yes, yes. Uh, the, the standing pieces were an extension of the smaller cubes. I, I wanted to do larger uh, sculptures that were environmental, that you could walk around, that rather than just small little things. And so uh, essentially, I th used to think of them as, as uh, uh, the cubes except opened up, mm -hmm. where oh, I so took the right angles of the cube and just made them 90 degrees to the floor and 90 degrees to each other. And, uh, and they stood? Yeah, they stood on the floor and you walked around them and they altered the way the light was reflected or transmitted in, those, in that environment. So the basis of what you were trying to show was light, space, working with those? Yes, I used to think of the pieces as uh, sort of t uh, three-dimensional tapestries of mm. reflected and transmitted light. And uh, the newer work that I'm doing now are really tapestries of absorbed and reflected light. Well, from, from this standing, you did one really huge piece called Iceberg, I think. Yes. What, that was in the... This was uh, in the 70s, and it was the largest sculpture I ever made. Um, it was quite big, you know. It filled the room? And it yeah. was, the, but it was <laughs> like lots of pieces of, like an iceberg. Yeah, yeah. It, I called it the iceberg because it had uh, so many different possible configurations that at any given installation you were only seeing the tip of the piece. There was, uh, there was uh, 56 panels which could go together in, a, in the uh, number of possibilities equal to the factor of 56. In other words, 56 times 55 and that total times 54 and that total times 53 and so on different ways of putting this thing together. At any given time, you, you, you were only seeing a very small part of the so piece. So it took a huge room to display it. Where is that piece now? It, it belongs to MIT. Uh, oh. A collector in New York purchased it and gave it to MIT. Oh, that's great. From that point, you went into the 80s, into a little bit of furniture yeah, design. Yeah, I designed some furniture. And the, the furniture uh, was based on uh, a quartered elliptical shape that in that illustration mm -hmm. there's a image on the wall and uh, for some reason this elliptical form has shown up in my work quite a bit. And this form right yeah, here. Yeah, right. And you see the profile of the chair there is actually a quarter of that shape up there. And then once you, you took the coating process off the glass, you put it onto the paper onto the like paper. we noticed right. it on, on the front of this. Right. And then it continued um, from paper. Well, I decided to try and expand the, uh, the different kinds of materials that I worked with. You know, I've decided that my media really is light and surface rather than paper or glass or wood or whatever. Because what I was interested in is the interface of the light and the surfaces. Mm -hmm. And, and the, um, the recent work, the works on canvas and so on, are really constructed images made up of materials uh, that are uh, coated with the same plating technique as on the glass. So is this one of the pieces yes, we're talking it is. about? Let's, ta it let's is. see if we can um, get a close-up of it. And then you can maybe start describing how this is a very new painting. This is a yes. painting from the 90s. Yes, I think a few months ago I did this. And, uh, but it starts changing. You see where the process that you came off the paper then goes on to no, canvas. What I decided to do was to uh, improvisationally make up different kinds of materials with the same coloration technique as on the glass and then combine those materials onto a surface so that um, I could take advantage of the different ways that the light was different on each of the different layers. In this composition, we have maybe 30 layers of things there. But then how do the layers get placed onto the canvas? In a laminating technique, which is not too dissimilar to the way license plates are sealed in a piece of plastic. You don't stick it in that machine anymore no. and take the it No, the only thing out. I stick in the machine are the materials that are colored. 
the, to color the materials that I use in the composition, the canvas doesn't go into the machine. Oh, it doesn't no. go in. The canvas goes into a press that actually laminates, that melts the different materials together and fuses them to the... Uh, so to as you build up, you get more light underneath? Yeah, exactly. The, 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 the image here is really made up of light reflecting and absorbing differentials. Certain areas of the canvas reflect more light and certain areas absorb more light. And the reason that they do so is that this plating technique varies in its effect in, on the different materials. Does it matter what color the canvas is? Because this piece is black that's no. now on the screen. I, uh, it doesn't... I mean a black it, canvas, it, primed canvas. It, it matters only in the sense that it, the images have a different kind of feeling to them. And I use it not for any technical reason, but just to, after I get tired of working on the white surface for a while, I'll um. just make some ones on black surface. The images are very much the same. It's just how they interact with the surface plane is different uh, depending on what, whether it's black or white. And also, these pieces don't have any predetermined orientation. I was going to ask you about yeah. that. Do you sit down and say, I'm going to use blues and reds and get these colors in, a, in this kind of... No, I don't think about that like that. I make up a vast supply of materials to use for these collages. And then I just try and be spontaneous as I can in assembling them or using the materials so that uh, the compositions come out very intuitive. In other words, my experience with this material in the past has allowed me to uh, put these things together without thinking of them consciously. They just happen. And because of what you've done, we have to leave. But I want to just say that during the years of your career, you've received a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, a National Endowment, and recently the Governor's Award uh, for the State of New Mexico. We've lost you from California, we feel, kind of, now that you've gotten this award. but. You'll always be a California boy. <laughs> well, I, I think of myself as being just as much at home here as I am there. I like Los Angeles. I, did, I didn't really move out of here because I didn't like it. I left because I liked it too much. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Larry Bell, for being with us. And thank you for being with us on Joan Quinn, etc. See you next time.